All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. Alicia, we have a special guest. It's a very timely episode, actually. Perfect time. Uh, Shayla Shanae. Yep. Got it. Um, Got it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> celebrity vocal health expert. Mm -hmm. Founder of Vocal Wall Street with over 20 years in the industry. You specialize in vocal care, confidence building, performance coaching. You've worked with Grammy winners and you advocate for mental health. So yeah. it's an interesting dynamic because we have the Nipsey Hustle business um, pitch competition. Mm -hmm. And you were saying that, you know, one of the biggest, well, probably the biggest fear for most people is public speaking. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you help people formulate their ideas and be able to communicate publicly. Right? Absolutely. Uh, what we find is about 75% of people just alone deal with something called glossophobia, which is a, a, is a, a severe fear of speaking in public. Mm. And we find that a lot of people don't even apply for jobs. About 30% of people don't even apply for jobs because if they have to do public speaking. So because of that, it is a real issue and probably one of the reasons why maybe some people may not even enter for the pitch competition just because of that so yeah. good um, perspective yeah yeah it's interesting well first and foremost thank you for joining us appreciate it thank you for having me absolutely um all right so let's get into it because you know i'm a communications major so I, I learned that early that public speaking is one of is the biggest fear of you of adults yeah um and it's something that most people never really get over yeah and like you said it's something that especially this is a business show so if you're not able to communicate that's going to tremendously hurt you absolutely right um so let's talk about this how did you even get into this field and what made you want to start working with people so I first started out in the entertainment industry. Um, I was a music business major and I was I have two degrees. So one in music education and pedagogy and another in music business. Um, I actually dropped out of grad school. I was mm. doing a MBA in human resource management and I had an opportunity to start touring. I met the legendary Betty Wright, um, who was already known by so many in the industry and she took me under her wings as a mentor. And from there I started touring all over the world. Um, touring doing what? Music? As a background professional background singer, okay, yeah, uh, touring all over the world, um, and also too on my spare time, I was a teacher in the public school system. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and from there, I developed my own vocal issues. Um, I developed some called vocal nodules, which are uh, two bumps that form on the side of your vocal cords, and as a result of that, I lost my job because of it. And I only had $500 in my pocket. So from that, I had to figure out what was I going to do. And by that time, a lot of people knew that I was helping other people get their voices uh, together. Uh, long story short, I started working with a lot of singers in the industry. And then as I started to get a lot more known in what I did, I knew people like Eric Thomas and Jeremy Anderson. And I remember Eric coming to me and saying, sis, my voice is going, my voice is getting raspier and raspier and raspier. And I said, wait a minute. It's not just singers that need me. There are speakers over here that need me as well. So I started working with speakers then. Um, and then I met Neo. And Neo had a mastermind. And Neo lost his voice in the first day of the three-day mastermind. And uh -oh. as you know already, uh, amateurs make money on the front end, but experts make money on the back end. And he almost lost $4.2 million because of that. So I had to end up getting him vocally rehabilitated. And really, that's how my career really started to blow up, but working with singers first and then speakers. And then I had a lot of uh, speakers that wanted to get into the public speaking space, uh, especially with live pitching. And I was able to help them to learn how to formulate overcoming speaking anxiety, as well as nailing their elevator pitches so you said vocal rehabilitation yes this, this is interesting so yeah let's just take him for example shout out to neil that's our guy how how did you diagnose this right did, yeah you did you could obviously hear it but what was the causes was he straining what like what did you see yeah while he was speaking and like he needs some he needs some assistance absolutely that's a great question so first thing is mike a lot of times, a lot of speakers never think about their microphone uh, etiquette when they're on stage. And he had a lapel mic and the, the lapel mic was so much was all the way up here. So he was screaming the whole time. And I tell any speaker that's doing masterminds or anything publicly, it's important for you to make sure that you practice proper microphone etiquette so that things don't happen like that. He also really didn't know how to utilize his voice as far as how to project it and carry it. And that is something that we I teach called just uh, resonation. So 
learning how to properly place your voice with intonations and inflections that will cause him not to put so much strain on his throat and then on his, his vocal cords. And then also to one of the biggest challenges that a lot of speakers have and which Neo did have was not drinking water in between speaking. It doesn't matter if you're on podcast, it doesn't matter if you're on stage, you always should be taking sips of water because your vocal cords don't really get the water to them directly. So you have to be hydrating over long periods of time so that your body itself can create what we call watery mucus that high, that lubricates the vocal cords. So there's a combination of a couple things that I recognize. One, he wasn't drinking enough water. Two, poor microphone etiquette, uh, not breathing correctly and utilizing breath support to the voice. All of these things were that's, uh, variables that actually caused these issues. So, okay. So let's get into this. Yeah. <clears throat> what... What are people doing wrong when it comes to public speaking and what are like the, the 10 commandments or say to actually always keep in mind when doing public speaking? Great question. Uh, one of the things that I say to speakers all the time is you're a vocal athlete. So just like how every great athlete out here has a coach, a lot of speakers don't even have speaking coaches. They don't have vocal coaches. So the first thing is get a coach. Uh, the second thing that I would say when it comes to, like you say, the Ten Commandments is you need to have a warm up regimen, just like how you have to stretch before you ball on the court. It's the same thing before you get on a podcast, before you get on stage to speak, do vocal warm up. So I actually give the top six vocal warm ups that speakers can do. Can I share one with yeah, you all? Sure. So one of the things that they can do, for example, is literally just and it may seem a little weird, but literally you can do what we call lip trills. And you just go for males, you all can be deeper. What that does is called SOVT exercises. It's just muscle relaxation exercises. So it will help you to actually stretch those muscles so that you don't have to uh, be straining. You'll be surprised what happens. You'll lose your voice quicker. So make sure you get a coach. Second thing is make sure you have a warm-up regimen. Third thing is hydrate hydrate, hydrate. A lot of people are dehydrated. And because of that, speakers never think about why they need to hydrate. Uh, practice proper microphone etiquette, right? The next one I would say is learn how to breathe correctly. But also another thing too is slow down. Make sure that you're speaking clear and concise. Um, I see a lot of speakers uh, when anxiety starts to come up, you know, they get very anxious and nervous. And because of that, they'll either speak faster, they'll start to stutter and things like that. So just making sure that you take a moment and breathe um, and make sure that you can be able to formulate in your head what you're going to say next so that you don't stutter. I would say another thing too is a lot of people strain and scream a lot and you don't have to do that, right? Um, if you learn how to really project your voice best, you'll know that you can be able to say what you need to say, make sure you're speaking directly into the mic and be able to project well. Um, there's so many others that's there, but those are the primary things a lot of people just deal with, making sure that they can project their voice, making sure that they have proper breathing etiquette, making sure that their message is clear and concise, they're articulating. And also too, I think one of the biggest common mistakes too that I see a lot of speakers do is they don't have proper eye contact with their audience when they're on stage. Mm -hmm. You'll be surprised that you can lose a person in the first 28 seconds of a speech. And so when you when we are doing the pitch judging and when you all are doing the pitch judging, in the first 30 seconds, you're gonna know from that person being on stage if they're actually serious about what they're doing and if they're prepared. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna talk on, on three things because most people think it's get up, talk in front of the microphone, and however I deliver it, people will receive it. Yeah. But the, the three most important things I'm hearing, tonality, Yes. because most I think I can sing, but some people tell me I'm tone deaf when I try. <laughs> pitch and projection mm -hmm. so can you break, break down those three and tell the differences and, and how important they are when somebody is going to give a speech absolutely have you ever sat uh and listened to someone's speech with the same monotone yes <laughs> okay uh, i'm sure you tap out after a while and what we're finding is that tonal inflections are a big thing uh making sure that you can raise the pitch sometimes men sometimes it's kind of challenging to do that Women, we are more prone to do those things, but you'd be surprised there are people that have mastered the art of public speaking where they've learned to match intonation. So learning when to go low 
in your tone, learning when to go higher in your tone. And that should happen when people are pitching. Um, I actually teach a lot of speakers when they're on stage, when they first make an intro, to make sure with intonation as a speaker that they are practicing with their pitch control going up and down. It, it does something to the listener and it's gonna do something psychologically to you as well. Uh, and so that's one of the things I will say with intonality. When it comes to projection, I can't stress it. Microphone etiquette is, the microphone is, is a connection to your voice. It continues your voice. Most microphones are one directional. So when you're on stage as a speaker, and I've seen this even in pitching, uh, the last pitch, I was a pitch judge at the last competition. I had speakers who were literally had their mics down here. And at the end of it, people couldn't really hear. You'd be surprised how that will affect a person's pitch. Just to the fact that they don't have that microphone here, I've seen people get a better response, making sure that their voice was connected to that microphone, than they just kind of walking around and the mic is all over the place. That interferes with projection. Um, there are times where a microphone goes out and you should be able to engage your diaphragm. You should be able to make sure that you are using the air to project your voice so that people can hear you so it doesn't stop the flow of the pitch should it happen. Uh, the other thing that I would say is definitely breathing exercises. It not only helps with reducing stress and anxiety and nerves and stage fright, but it also really helps with making sure that the quality of your sound is actually what it needs to be so that you can be able to effectively communicate to the audience and get your point across. You all are going to meet people that are going to have great visuals. They're going to tell you about their market, their preposition and their unique selling preposition. They're going to tell you about market stats and everything like that. But how they show up when they open up their mouth to speak is going to tell a lot about the decision that you make to choose a winner. It will. So, okay. Talk about elevator pitch. Yes. And, um, seven steps to nailing your elevator pitch. Yeah, so first things first is uh, anyone that's listening to this, if you're gonna be pitching, whether it's at InvestFest or you're gonna be pitching at any place, the first thing is you wanna have a clear and concise message. Who are you? What do you do? Who do you serve? What is what is it that you're actually giving to people? What do you want the judges to know or the investors to know? So have a clear and concise message. Uh, the second commandment that I would say is make sure that you know the problem. What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, lots of times I've seen people come and pitch, Rashad, and they really don't know what the problem is that they're trying to solve. They just want to sell a product to you or say, hey, can you invest in my product? So you have to make sure that when you're pitching, with your message being clear and concise, you need to make sure that you also know what the problem is. And then third, know the solution to the problem, right? What is What are you trying to solve? I understand you want to be able to have a tech company, but what is the tech company? What, what is the solution or what's the problem that's being solved and what's the solution? How What are the vehicles to solve that problem? Uh, the third thing is make sure that you know your market stats, right? What's going on in the market in the industry right now? A lot of people don't do their research on the industry stats, which leads to the next one, who's your competitor? right? I've seen people do pitches and we don't even know who your competitor is. You just tell us all about the business. But if we were to go deeper beyond a, a 60 minute elevator pitch, a 60 second, sorry, elevator pitch, and let's say that you all were to ask more questions, one of the questions that investors are going to ask is well, who your competitors are, what's the market? So because of that, it's important for, um, for anyone that's pitching to do that. Make sure that you're using proper visual aids. That's another thing too. I'm not really sure how it's going to be for InvestFest, when we get there, but if there are going to be visual aids, make sure that your visual aids are not all over the place. Make sure that you're not using all of these different fonts and colors and everything like that. Keep it clean, keep it fresh, but make sure that everyone, every judge that's looking or any investor that's investing into what are interested in what you have to say can understand it clearly in your visual aids. I will also say just making sure that as they go through the pitch, that they speak clearly, that they understand and also do a call to action. Um, we've had pitch, I've, I've sat in pitch uh, matches or pitch competitions where, so what are you asking for? You never really say what you're asking for. Be clear and concise and make sure that whatever the call to action is, that it is clear, it is realistic. I'm looking for $2 million to do what with? What's the the budget? What's the forecast? The, what's the, the numbers? That's another one, know your numbers, right? 
What are the numbers going to? Where is this money going to? When is it going to happen? Most investors don't want to be married long term to something. So we want to make sure that we understand. I'm an investor myself. Make sure that we understand what's the return on investment. Do we get equity? Right. All of these things are what people should be considering when it comes to their elevator pitch, whether it's 60 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, even up to a 30 minute pitch. Yeah, right. Tremendous insight because we get pitched all the time. Uh, yes. And so you, you actually have now just helped us. Yeah. And I'm sure everybody that's listening will take notes from it as well. Yeah. You said that vocal health is important. Yeah. And so these things sound like how I will prepare as I'm going to the stage. Yes. But there's that buildup. And I, we talked to a lot of people. We just had a pitch competition uh, a few months ago. And people were talking about the anxiety that it felt leading up to the day. So what are some of the type of things that you suggest for people leading up to this? Yes. And what should they be doing at home the week before, the month before, to prepare themselves for this moment, this five-minute moment that could change their lives potentially? Absolutely. First things, practice. Practice, practice, practice. And there's there's a couple ways in which a person can practice, right? Troy, so the first thing I'll say is practice in the mirror. See yourself. So you can see how your facial expressions look. See if the nerves are taking over, right? See yourself. And lots of times people do not like to see themselves. They don't even like to hear themselves back, right? You'd be surprised that a lot of anxiety that happens on the stage happens because of what people are going through in their personal lives. And it just comes over in there. So practice, practice, practice. Practice in front of family and friends and peers, a mentor, a coach, right? And also record yourself on video and watch yourself back with no judgment. That's one of the ways in which you can actually help yourself prepare for the pitch. Another one is actually do what we call mindfulness. Walk through the pitch without you having to say something. So how am I going to enter the stage? How am I going to intro myself? How am I going to speak what I need to say? How am I going to exit the stage? How am I going to leave? Like all of that is what we call mindfulness. Whether you're performing as an entertainer or speaker, that's one of the things that I'll tell people, sit through in mind, do mindfulness of it. Uh, another way to prepare is breathing techniques, believe it or not. Um, there's a couple of breathing techniques that I tell people to do. One is the four, seven, eight, is you breathe in for four counts, you hold it for seven counts, you breathe out for eight counts. What this does is it triggers what we call the parasymp parasympathetic nervous system, which is, if you're having like a warm bowl of super ice cream and you're kind of like calm, where there's something called a sympathetic mode, which is that fight or flight mode. The moment people get on a stage, their palms get sweaty, they want to use the bathroom, their knees want to buckle, their mouth gets dry. And so mindfulness breathing helps them to trigger that, that PNS, that parasympathetic mode. I always say too, arrive early. I tell people, go to the venue, see what it looks like. Like look at the stage, sit down on the in the chair and actually visualize what it's going to look like, the audience that's going to be there. Walk yourself through it as you do mindfulness, but be in the environment as well. That's going to help a lot in, pre in preparing. And then also to making sure that you have a backup. One of the, uh, I had a, a pitch competition that, <laughs> that I was a judge at. One of the persons forgot their visuals. And so they did a whole entire pitch asking for a whole bunch of money with no visuals whatsoever, mess up their entire elevator pitch. And so I tell those that are preparing, make sure you have a backup. If you're going to be doing something where you're sending something electronically, make sure you have something on a USB drive, a Google drive, some sort of electronic drive so that your anxiety can actually decrease. Because lots of times people kind of cause their own anxiety too because of lack of preparation. So those are practical things that they can do to prepare for their pitch. Yeah, just a follow up because a lot of times people will confuse anxiety with nervousness. Yes. Some people will say, it's healthy to feel nervous yes it's healthy to feel angst before something because you're prepared for it you want to deliver it yeah you want to do a great job yeah is it healthy or when does it not become healthy absolutely it's absolutely healthy to be nervous i was nervous coming here because i've never met you guys in person I, i'm like what are they going to ask me i don't know so there's something called good nerves you just can't allow those nerves to take over and become your master and that's where anxiety comes in anxiety and angst really says what if what if something happens and what do i need to do to prepare just in case what if happened so there's something between wisdom and then allowing anxiety to take over wisdom says you know what let me have a backup that's not anxiety, that's just wisdom. Mm. But anxiety is like all of the intrusive thoughts going through your head, that's literally just thoughts. Two things that I've learned in life, guys. 
No one owes me anything and never create a story. Anxiety is the culprit that helps people create stories that literally don't even exist. And so because of that, absolutely, there's a difference between nerves and anxiety. Nerves is good, right? But you don't have to let it master you. So, um, okay. So speaking about InvestFest, yeah. we have the Nipsey Hustle Business Grant Competition, yeah. $100,000. And you're going to be one of the judges. Yes, I'm excited. Um, Shout out to Microsoft. <laughs> yep, in the marathon. In the marathon, yep. So, okay. So how it works is that we have day one where 150 people will yeah. audition for a chance to make it to the final round. So for A, what are you going to be looking for as a judge, right? And then B, what are some tips that you can give to people that have entered the competition and will be pitching for a chance to win $100,000? Yeah, um, I want to know who's done their research. And the reason why I say that is because they need to be doing their research on you all. They need to be doing their research on InvestFest. They need to be doing their research on the Nipsey, Nipsey uh, Hustle Foundation or the Neighborhood Foundation. They need to be doing their research on Microsoft. And the reason why I said it is like, well, what does that have to do with anything? It has a lot to do with it because you all came together to say, we wanna present 100K to someone um, that we feel deem to actually win this money. So find out the why of why you all are doing it, whether it's partnership, I think it's important for them to do their research first and not just see, see it as money. So I will look for that. Even, even if they don't say it, I'm going to look as a, as a judge to see if they're going to thank you all for the opportunity to see if I were to ask a question, what do you know about the, the Neighborhood Foundation? What do you know about InvestFest, right? And how do you think what their initiative does aligns with what you do? Because I think for judges, especially if we're helping you all to give this money away, it's important that they also understand and align with your initiatives and what you all do. Um, I'm also going to be looking for presence, stage presence. How well do you uh, engage us in the first 27 seconds? What's your opening line, right? Are you going straight to the message? What is it that you do? What is it that you're looking for? How are you going to use that money? Uh, what's going to be the return on investment? How do you plan to grow that money? Uh, what are you looking from us to do? And then also too, how do we partner and play a, a part in it? So I'm going to be looking for stage present, clear and concise message. I'm going to be looking at how prepared are they? Did they do their research for their own business? Do they understand the market stats? Do they understand their competition? Do they understand their why behind it? Not only that, I think if I were to go further, I don't know if we're gonna be able to ask questions further. I would even look to see with their financial projections and their numbers, I'd like to see what their back end looks like. So who's on your team, right? Who's gonna help you to take this money and carry it forth? Uh, are you the janitor of your business? Or are you gonna be the person that's going to utilize this for staff, utilize this for marketing, for sales? I wanna know all those things. Right. So those are some of the things that I'm going to be looking for, because I know we we do the prelims and then you all do the final. So, uh, you know, jump ahead. This is just, it's a lot of game. A lot of game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm saying I got y'all. I got y'all. We, we just got asked. Uh, we were out at a BT weekend and somebody asked me, what are the things that yeah. we're looking for? And I'm like, well, if I told you that would kind of be like insider information. Yeah. But this feels like the real insider information. <laughs> I, you, so all those things that you're looking for, what are some of the bad habits that yeah. you're also looking for so that when people are coming, they know, all right, this is what one of the judges said about the bad habits I shouldn't present. What yeah. are some of those things? Bad habits is you just come lack, not prepared. Hmm. Man, I've... <laughs> I will tap out in the first 15 seconds. If you just, if you show it up and you don't show up to brand, like if you showing up and you don't even look the part, dress the way that you want to be addressed. So at the end of the day, show up as if you're, you seriously want 100K. I'm not going to put 100K in somebody's hands that's just showing up any kind of way, right? So make sure, like I showed up today in my brand, right? Um, I believe that that plays a part. So I want to see who's going to show up. And one of the biggest mistakes I see people do is, they think this is just the visual aids. No, you are the visual aid. You're the walking billboard for your company. So when you get on that stage, show up to present, dress that way. But then also too, um, another mistake is not being prepared with their visual aids, not doing the research. A lot of them uh, uh, not giving eye contact, not being clear. 
They don't have a call to action. All of these things are common mistakes that I see people do all the time. And because of that, those are the things you should not do, guys. Please don't do that. All right. Um, especially for us that's doing the job for you all is to make your choices easier. We should make your choices easier as the coaches so that you all can make your decision for the top four. Right. So what whoever comes to you all for the top four is a reflection of us as that's, your coaches. That's a fact. It's a very important role because like you said, that the top four, we don't have any say so in that. So, you know, it's um whoever's gonna be on that stage, you know, is gonna be determined by the the, the day before. Absolutely. So it's definitely a very important role to play. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well staying on Invest Fest for a minute. So you also are a vendor. You've been I a vendor am. for a while, right? And then you yes. so you you have an interesting success story. So can you talk about your experience as how did you get involved in being a vendor and talk about um, you know, I think you made three hundred thousand dollars, something like I that. I did. So shout out to Neo. You know, I give him his credit where his credit is due. He can't <laughs> ball, but it's okay. Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> Neil think he could be everybody in anything. Even we have up, a pool please. rivalry, a billiards rivalry. <laughs> so he think he could just play me in anything. But Neil actually was the one that told me about Invest Fest. He said, Shayla, you know, you need to come to this. You need to come to Atlanta. So my first uh, event, we actually entered late as a vendor. We were all the way in the back, like 900s or something like that. And we still, you know, we pulled up and I made 300K that weekend. The, when you was in the back? In the back. How, so how'd you do it? All right, hack. I brought my closers with me. I put them on the floor. So um, at my booth, my booth was surrounded with nothing but closers. And then of course we had people, you know, with signs and everything like that. But we also made sure that our banners and, our, and everything, we spoke the pain point. So we told you your pain point. We told you your issue. You're not making money with your voice right now. You are dealing with speaking anxiety and fear. You need to learn how to make your voice become a business and your intellectual property a business. So we actually told them the payment that that's how we were able to do it. And you were selling your coaching services? Yes, we were doing uh, services of digital products as well as high ticket coaching. So that was year one. That's year one. So you came back for year two. <laughs> came back for year two and, and, and crushed it. <laughs> and crushed it. Uh, we did about a 500K. Yeah. And so now this year, uh, our third year, we decided, you know what? Nah, we about to be next to the, uh, you know, to the Neos and stuff like that. So we decided to say, you know, let's go ahead and just get a 20 by 20. Um, and also just help, you know, show people um, how to nail the elevator pitch in 60 seconds. Just give advice. We're, you know, I, we have to be very careful because I am a pitch judge, but we want to just give basic advice. Whether it's InvestFest or anyone, how do you just overcome speaking anxiety, right? How you're able to just be able to let people know who you are on the floor mm -hmm. in the actual, because that's where a lot of the magic happens. And a lot of people, because they deal with it, speaking, speaking anxiety is not just on stage, it's even in the marketplace. They don't know how to approach someone. They don't know how to go up and share their advice or share their brand or say who they are. And then they let the bag go. They let opportunities pass by because of it. Yeah. So we want to we want to show people how to work the room as well. Yeah. So speaking of the, the future guidance, let's talk about your industry. Mm -hmm. Obviously, over the past couple of years, have you seen an influx as we see more entrepreneurs? And you said they're the billboard for the brand. Yeah. And they have to speak. Yeah. Talk about the influx of people that are now coming to get the services. Yeah, we're seeing younger and younger. Uh, we're in an entrepreneurial generation. So I'm a, I am call myself a geriatric millennial. So for me, I'm in the 80s, right? But give me some. Give me some. <laughs> we as doing? we're in the 80s, yeah. but um, you know, I'm between like that generation where my mom was like, save, 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 go to school, get a degree, work for people. But then I'm in this whole other generation where it's just like, nah, we invest and we taking risks. You know, we're doing things and we're finding, I've, I've noticed the trend with InvestFest. You're, first of all, you place yourself in the middle of college town, right? I saw so many people come to our boot that were actually college kids that also had two properties already. Right. And so because of that, for us, we're finding that more and more younger entrepreneurs want to get into the space of public speaking, um, learning to create passive streams of income using their intellectual property. Um, and, I, and, and I just literally started talking about a vocal NFT. Uh, we've been talking about the AI world. It's just a lot happening. But the trend right now is a lot of people are really want to get into this space. And with the digital age of TikTok, Instagram, lives, podcasting yeah we're thriving in this industry right now so um who do you work most with public speakers or entrepreneurs that just want to just be able to communicate public speakers that are entrepreneurs 
Yeah. That it's it's really a hybrid. Um, and it's not just public speakers. We have a lot of entertainers now that are crossing over. Um, interestingly enough, last year I started working with NFL players and WNBA players. Mm. We have a lot of athletes now that are either getting injured, they're getting cut from the team, and a lot of them don't know who they are beyond the court or the field. And so um, it's kind of interesting, the dynamic that I've been now uh, connected to, where I have a lot of athletes that want to learn how to get into the public speaking space, and they don't know their value. A lot of them deal with imposter syndrome and value syndrome. Um, and so they don't know what to charge. They go and they speak for free. Um, as a matter of fact, I met Eric Thomas at the age of 19. Eric and I were, were doing ministry together. So Eric would go to schools and, and speak for free and I would sing. And then I met Jeremy and we started doing things together. And I've seen the evolution of ET, but I it, it's interesting to me how these athletes and these speakers, they don't know their value. And so now they're learning about how to charge, but then also how to business and entrepreneur that part of them, which a lot of them don't do. Yeah. yeah. You're seeing it more and more like athletes are becoming brands off the field. Absolutely. I'm thinking as the as you take them on as clients, what's the first thing that you assess, right? Yeah. If, when you meet them, do you just have a conversation and from the conversation, are you picking up tonality? Are you picking up these things and assessing it as you go? I forecast them. Okay. So as I'm speaking, we'll just have a regular conversation and I'll say, "What do you see yourself in 365 days from now if you were at the optimal, like you were just at the you were doing everything you wanted to do in life?" Um and they will literally tell me, I want to do this. I want to speak more. I want to do this. Okay. Well, what's stopping you from doing that? Well, I don't know. I just, you know, I don't really know what to charge. Okay. Well, how much do you think that you're worth? If we were to do a valuation on your vocal real estate, what do you think that's worth right now? That's why my company is called Vocal Wall Street, because it's about really learning how to diversify your vocal portfolio. And a lot of people think that a vocal coach is just for singers. No, I deal with voices period, the literal voice and the figurative voice, which is your purpose, your reason for being. And so that's what I would do. I forecast them and I let them tell me where their dreams are. And then I just tell them, okay, well, this is what we're going to do to get there. Yeah. Do, do, do you ever listen to a podcast or listen to a show mm -hmm. and say, that's somebody I want to work with? Yes. I feel like it's happening right now. I, guess. <laughs> <laughs> I feel yeah, like something I, may be happening. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and, and, um, I, my, I'm here to add value to what you all do. It's interesting. I was actually watching um, Amazon Business uh, partnered with Entrepreneur, mm -hmm. and they just actually launched. We might have to talk about this off the record. Something that I, you know you might want to do, but they actually launched a TV show specifically to something like this. Um, and the one thing I didn't see that they didn't have was a person like me. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So how do you overcome speaking anxiety um, to close a deal when you're pitching to investors? Yeah, first of all, you have to re you have to tell yourself it's not about me. It's not about me. Um, I tell businesses all the time or brands that I work with, why are you even doing business? And your profession is not the same as your business, right? If I ask you what your profession is, you may be like, I'm an accountant. That's your profession, but that's not your business, right? Um, a lot of people, Shad, don't know their why. And because of that, why would I give you 100K if you don't even know why you get up every day to do what you do, right? So how do you overcome it outside of the mindfulness and everything that I've shared is you have to know when I get on that stage, it's not about me. I am doing a disservice to people who should have my solution. And every single time that I allow uh, speaking anxiety to take over, it allows me to forfeit my why. Do you understand? Sometimes you have to step outside of the business and the practicality of saying breathe and stuff like that and go to the mental. Why are you doing this? Why are you on the stage? Uh, so I would start there as well. Um, everything else that I've shared already about the practical things that you need to do, but also to just knowing that you deserve to be in the room. I tell people all the time, never waste to show up, never waste to show up. And I'll say this to, to anyone that may be pitching, you may not win that 100K. And I look, I don't know if the camera's here. You may not win that 100K, but the fact that you stepped on that stage, you don't know who your next connection will be in the audience. You don't know if one of the judges may come to you and say, yo, I didn't, you didn't get that 100K, but I still want to work with you on the side. So never waste a show up. If, if the opportunity is there, 
for you to do it, then do it and prepare yourself for that. So to overcome that speaking anxiety, you have to keep showing up. Get to more pitch competitions. Don't just wait for the main stage, right? Find what are all the local pitch competitions or pitch matches in your city and show up to them. Pitch in rooms. Go in the marketplace in InvestFest or any room conference and just start speaking to people and let them know who you are, what you do, who you serve, and what's the payoff, which is the solution. And that's going to help you really practice how to overcome uh, speaking anxiety for anything, including InvestFest. What's the difference between pitching to like investors Mm -hmm. and privately and speaking on stage and pitching. Yeah. Like, is it a difference or is it like one is more, you know, personal and that yeah. communication one, you just speak into a, a wide audience? Like what's the difference between like that? Yeah, there are different types of pitches, right? So other types of pitches that like, there are investors that are looking to match with companies. And sometimes too, it's not just the the small businesses looking for money, there's investors that also have speaking anxiety that don't know how to um, pitch to, to others, right? So for example, I was at uh, an event and there was a billionaire on stage. He's a fund, he, he raised all this money, like a billion dollars. And he was on stage trying to say who he is to all these business owners. And he was so nervous, he clamped up, right? So when it comes to the difference between being on stage and then being personal, there's different types of pitches. I would say if you can manage the stage, then you can manage the private, but you'll be surprised, Rashad, how more people are more nervous in personal pitching than on stage. It's, it's, it's amazing to me how just both of you all sitting here, somebody can literally clam up, but then they get on stage, they're like, fine. And I think a lot of that is just, like I say, the, the sympathetic mode and all of the things that go through our head that we think that we're not good enough. What if they think I'm a fraud? What if they think I'm a failure? Um, but I would say it varies. How do you work on bridge words? Like, um, and like that's, I realized that that's when people are thinking too fast. Yeah. And they can't, so they use words like um, or they help pause because they're trying to actually catch their brain up with the, yeah. with the words that they're trying to say. So that's very common for people yeah. across the board. Yeah. How do you help people get over that? Breathing techniques. So one of the things that we um, I teach is take the breathe, take the breath. What happens, the, the, the mind or the brain catches up to the next word. So it's something you have to practice. It's not just something that just happens. So let's say like even now I'm speaking to you, I'm slowing down, but I'll, I'll stop. And then by that time, I already know what I want to say. So one of the simple ways to actually combat the ums and the ahs is to actually do the pausing, slow down, take a breath. The brain will catch up. Mm. Definitely. This is a part that, again, will come down to the, the four people that are selected or four groups that are selected. Mm -hmm. There might be a QA and a yes. session. How should they approach this? Um, is it important to call the judges by their name? Like, what are the techniques now what, that you've gotten to a point where it's a Q&A inside of a pitch? Yeah, depending. I think you have to be able to read the room. Uh, you're going to find some judges that are very welcoming and warm with their faces. So that allows the person that is actually pitching to feel warm. They mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, you may find some pitch judges that are more stoic, <laughs> right, and more to the point and sometimes it's like okay we just mean mean business what i tell a person all the time is be your authentic self right no matter if a judge is not looking at you some people think that because a judge is not giving you eye contact that they're not interested that's not the case so when on stage and especially when it comes to the q a's for investors uh, little plug, I do have something called the 10 questions that all investors ask. I want to actually give a, a gift to you all for your audience. I'm going to give a freebie out, which mm -hmm. is a checklist for pitching. Um, and it also has a bonus of um, 10 questions so they can start to prepare. But I do know that when it comes to those questions, preparation is key. If you know ahead what are the primary questions that will happen, you'll be more prepared to answer those questions with whether it's a stoic judge or a, a more you know welcoming judge. Uh, I think that um, preparation is key for that. So how much of it is just natural ability? <clears throat> Some people are just natural. I have some uh, mentees of mine that just have a knack for speaking. 
you know, some of it's natural, but they still sometimes need to be honed in because sometimes they can have this natural aura of speaking, but they ramble or they have a natural aura of speaking, but they go off topic or they don't stay to the key points. And one of the things that I say to those people that are super extroverted and they're going on stage, you still have to make sure that you reel it in so that we can understand exactly and you're, you're here for a reason. I've seen it on both ends of the spectrum. Right. For those people that have that natural knack. I think Neo has a natural knack for speaking. Right. But ever so often, Neo's asked me questions like, Shayla, what should I do for this? What should I do for that? Right. And I think it's always important for anyone that has that natural ability, just like any basketball player. Some of these kids just have a natural ability to play street ball, but that doesn't mean they're ready for the NBA. You know, and so because of that, not because a person has a natural ability to speak means that they just just be wild and as a speaker still get coaching. Right. So especially if you want to be taken seriously, but also, too, if you're really to, wanting to close those multimillion dollar deals, whether it's in real estate, whatever it is, or you want to be taken seriously as an actual renowned speaker, get polished. How, how concise should the presentation be? We've seen people who have pitched and they've had paragraphs up yes. there. <laughs> and then we've seen people that have had a few bullet points up there. Yes. Which one makes more sense or does it depend on the person and their comfortability when they're, when they're presenting? Yeah, it depends on the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, for example, uh, one pitch competition I did, uh, we told them it was a two minute pitch. They were going six minutes. That's another mistake too. If you're given an allotted time, if it's 60 seconds, pitch in 60 seconds. And a 60 second pitch is easy. Who are you? How much money are you looking for? Where do you want to put the monies? How the money's going to grow in what time? What's the call to action or what are you looking for? And how it's going to be the return on investment? It can happen in 60 seconds, right? Um, but it's really the time. What, um, okay, so best practices for vendors because mm -hmm. you have a successful vendor story, but mm -hmm. I'm sure you probably saw some other vendors that were not as successful, right? Mm -hmm. So is it the product that they're selling? Is it, like you said, you had people on the floor that was actually closing. What advice could you give for vendors to have a, a great experience? Study the market of the people coming to InvestFest and, and then adjust. Because if you are, let's say, if you know 75% of people coming to InvestFest are young males between the ages of 25 and, I don't know, 40, right? For you, if you have a toothbrush company or something like that, you need to figure out how am I going to make sure that this toothbrush connects with something of an entrepreneur on here versus just, hey, I'm just selling a toothbrush. It's gonna go over their heads. And what I see lots of times, I actually had somebody, I, I what I do uh, sometimes is I walk away from my booth and I'll actually go buy things because I like to support this black businesses, uh, especially women led businesses. And there were a couple of them, I was like, well, what, what is this? It, it was not clear. A lot of them just, it was just so much going on. It was just like, so you're selling this, 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 and this. But how does this relate to who we are in this room right now? And I think that's where a lot of uh, vendors miss the mark is because they, they haven't studied who your audience is mm. and know how to pivot to that audience so that you can reach that audience and hit their pain point. Yeah, a lot of intentionality mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing. How do you stay ahead? Because, I mean, I heard that you're an educator. Yes, and so that yes. tells me that lifelong learning, but in this space, what are you what are you researching how do you yeah. think, i mean even down to the microphones you talk so that must mean you know about the technology yes. so what are you doing to stay ahead to keep yourself ahead to make sure that you're always adapting to the space it's interesting i um i always ask myself where would i be in the next three to five years will the industry need me or not and where's the industry going right now and how do i need to make sure that i am keeping up with that industry um, every 18 months information changes and so if you see it even now in the space that we're in, a digital space where you may have one thing and then in the next 18 months, it no longer exists. Something new has come along. And for me to stay ahead, I'm always looking at, first of all, who is out there doing what I do? What are they doing? And then what are they not doing? And what are they not doing? What do I make sure that I do so that I can be ahead of the game, right? So I'm always looking at that. And then I'm always, I'm a mentor, I'm a mentee as well. Um, you know, when I first hit my first six figures, um, 
I was sitting at the feet of seven figure earners. I've hit my seven figures. Now I'm sitting at the feet of eight and nine figure earners. I just believe that you should never stop learning. And so I'm always looking to see, because I'm in a very unique space and a lot of my peers that are around me don't really do what I do, it has created a monopoly for me, but I also have to try to figure out what's the blueprint because there's not, I'm not doing credit. I'm not doing, you know, real estate. So because of that, I have to take what everyone does and say, how do I make it fit for mine? Um, and then how do I make that innovative? So that's how I stay ahead through mentorship, but also making sure that I can ask those questions to the future uh, version of my company and my business. And then also too, I'd say the last thing is how do I get out of a thing where I'm not in it? but my company can continue to go. What do I need to do to make sure that my company keeps going even if I'm not there anymore? Um, that And then what does that look like? And what do I need to put in place? Staff, team, things in place, systems, structure, right? In place so that I can be able to always stay ahead and ask questions. Yeah. So uh, as far as engaging with the audience, what are some tips to ask questions, get audience feedback, tell jokes? Like that's all part of being a good public speaker as well, right? To kind of shake it up a little bit. So yeah. how should somebody position those type of things inside of their conversation? Yeah, um, I definitely believe that asking questions and doing uh, what we call call and response, right? So I've seen people come up and say, I need everybody to say right now, secure the bag, secure the bag. I didn't hear you, secure the bag, secure the bag. Come on, say it again, secure the bag, secure the bag, let's go. They'll start it off just like that, right? Mm -hmm. We see a lot of our peers do that. Yeah. That automatically gets them. So yeah, call and response is a great tactic to use. Um, I, I would say like a comedian on stage, you gotta know uh, the aspects where you can drop something, uh, but you also gotta make sure that it stays in the timing. So that's a great question. Hand gestures, smiling, eye contact. Um, call and response are great things that you can use to actually engage your audience without coming off corny hmm. or yeah. overdoing it. You feel me? Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to the educator. I'm listen <laughs> I, I hear ministry in there because yeah. I, I've watched my brother prepare for sermon. And yeah. when you listen to somebody preach, it, there's an opening, then there's a crescendo, then there's yes. a call to action. How, how important is that in giving an effective speech? Is it the same technique? It is. And and here's another one, Rashad. That was a great question you asked me, and I'm going to piggyback and connect it with you. Tell your story. People connect with your story. So it's the same thing with sermons. People will be drawn in if you say, man, I remember I started this business because I got laid off and I only had $500 to my name and the, and the rent had to be paid. And I was figuring out how am I going to do this? And not only that, I lost my job because I didn't have no, uh, I didn't have no voice. So I had to do what I had to do. I had to go back that 130K education that I had at that school. I had to go put it in place. I had to figure out what I needed to do. Tell a story with it. That's going to bring people in and then carry them through the journey with the inflections. Yeah. So do the exposition, the, uh, the stasis that we call the rising uh, action, the fall in action, the conclusion. Yeah. And storytelling. So talk about a lot of times people might get discouraged as far as if they're more introverted person and think that the public speaking is not for them. But a lot of public speakers are actually introverts from like Deion Sanders, somebody that we met mm -hmm. who's a very introverted person. It's hard to tell that from his online persona, yeah. but he's not really an extroverted person if you ever meet him in person. Most actors are introverts. Uh, Robert De Niro, famous introvert. Uh, Al Pacino, all of those guys, they're very intro. Most actors, if you really think about it, Leonardo DiCaprio, all of these guys, you never see them. They don't speak publicly, like unless, but in in front of a camera, they're very, and a lot of musicians as well, from yeah. Prince, Michael Jackson, Beyonce, Jay Z. So there's an interesting dynamic when you think about it, right? That most of the time, the people that you see in the forefront of the camera are really introverted people. Yeah. So speak about that because I feel like a lot of people might feel like this isn't for them Yeah, if they're not an extremely extroverted person. Absolutely. So talk about ministry a little bit. One of the things that the pandemic taught us is we had to make, we had to make a decision. Are we a human doing or a human being? The reason why so many creatives are introverted by nature is because the human doing of us calls us to be extroverted, but the human being of us is more reserved than introverted. And it's a perfect con contradiction in a sense. Um, and I think that if 
people don't gauge that well. And when I say gauge, I mean, gauge it through therapy, gauge it through having a coach, gauge it through that. You're going to find people either one, be put in spaces they're not ready for, and then they don't know how to handle it. And then they revert to things like drugs and alcohol, which we see a lot of people do or people that win competitions and they weren't ready for the fame right? When it comes to someone that's actually doing pitch competitions, and I, I know somebody right now who wants to actually enter into the pitch competition, but because they are severely introverted and shy, it's like an internal conflict with them. And so a person like that will have to do one actual coaching, um, but also they would have to go through a mindset reset, right? Through therapy, but also through a mindfulness, a mindset coach or something like that, because it goes deeper than the introversion, right? It really, really does. Um, and then asking yourself, well, if you don't want to do this, who can pitch on your behalf? Do you know that there are other people that can pitch on another person's behalf? Uh, I was a, a, a one of the, the same pitch competition I did. The, the actual owner of the company wasn't there. She had her representatives pitch for her. So that can be an alternative too for those people that may be introverted, that may not have the courage to pitch publicly, send a representative. But why, I'm just thinking about this though. Yeah. Why is this, because that's actually an interesting stat if you think about it. Yeah. Michael Jackson, Prince, Beyonce, these are some of the, these are probably the three biggest artists of all yeah. time. And they're all introverts, especially Prince and Michael Jackson. And then even if you look at hip hop, like I said, some of the biggest hip hop artists, Eminem, yeah. notorious introvert. Um, you have some extroverts like Tupac, uh, but a lot of big name artists are yeah. very introverted people. Why Why do you think that that is? You know, I, I can't really answer for everybody, but you know what I've noticed? A lot of them create alter egos. Mm. <laughs> think about it yeah. so they have to go and create a whole nother persona of themselves in order to be called to the demand of the talent of them right but then also too we've seen how that has also caused the demise of a lot of people because of it and that's why i'm saying it's such a layers to that you understand that you would have to but i think a lot of people create those alter equals for a reason to combat the actual i don't know if it's it's the I wouldn't say trauma, but to combat the actual the struggle <laughs> of the introvert and and what's called to them yeah. as an artist. It, it almost feels like, especially with entertainers, the the instrument is the talent, right? Their yeah. vocal is the instrument, and so at a certain point, it's I'm using this on a daily basis. Yeah. When I don't have to use it, I want I'm just going to turn it off. Yeah. Whereas where rest comes into it, right? Like I, that was I, I wanted to just go into that because that's important too about people who speak all the time yeah at what point is it we need to rest our vocal cords yes i saw lapita uh yango the other day she actually had to stop speaking for three months and had to walk around with a sticker saying no i'm not being rude my vocal coach told me to stop talking so like when does that come to a play because if i was as you're saying it, i'm like yeah that is kind of true but are they doing that with the intent that i need to rest the instrument that provides a living for me. Absolutely. I, I'd say to anyone, and especially just on the vocal health tip really quickly uh, for, for you all that are in the public speaking space and this platform, it's very important. Your vocal cords aren't bionic. So the vocal cords need rest. And a lot of people that end up dealing with like hoarseness and stuff like that because of overworking, overusing their voice, over speaking all the time. Um, I don't know if this has to do necessarily with the introvert extrovert thing mm. but if uh, like she has a coach so her coach is giving her actual wise sound advice to say you need to rest the voice because the voice is sounding compromised um it takes about three to five days if there's any swelling on those folds if you're dealing with hoarseness for the swelling to come down so it is very very especially for my my clients that tour mm. um i have a lot of clients that are doing I mean, strenuous tours right now, especially European tours and stuff like that. And they're like having one rest day. And that one rest day is a travel day on a tour bus with a whole bunch of people and viruses going all over the place. And so uh, because of that, no, rest is, is there's no, I'll, I'll say this, there is no uh, remedy for when your voice goes out when you speak, all right? There's two different things that happens, either dysphonia, which is hoarseness of the voice, in which that happened with Neo, um, but then there's something called aphonia, which is total loss of the voice. There is no drink you can drink, there's no tea, there's no spray, there's no nothing to do that. That is rest and hydration. 
period. You know who's another one who his public persona is different than his personal persona? Yeah. Who's going to be at Invest Fest is who's Steve, that? Steve Harvey. Oh, okay. So if you meet him and you get to really spend time with him, it's he turns it on and off. Mm. Like he he's very vocal in front of a camera and he he can tell a joke, but then at, like he's very like subdued, yeah, laid back, quiet. He don't really like to talk a lot. So that is another thing where somebody probably would be surprised because he's a comedian. Yeah, and you would think that you know he's always on go, always telling jokes all the time. But yeah. I feel like part of it is probably he's just tired because he's been doing it for forty years. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, he's not really like the most like bubbly mm. person yeah. when you meet him. Not to say he's really? like I got a bad yeah. personality, but it's like he, he it, I know it. We met him a, a lot of times, so we kind of. But I know that most people they probably would be surprised. Yeah, because they like I didn't think like I would think he's like. Yeah. Family feud every day, every day of the week. Yeah, like, you know? yeah. That's happened a few times. We run into yeah. even Martin Lawrence. It was like we ran into Martin, and it was like we're expecting. It's like I heard that the other day from somebody else. And it's too. like, well, that's the character. Yeah, and this is the man. Kind of like what you're saying. And it's, again, the people that you brought up is interesting because yeah. these are the highest level of yeah. creatives. And so it's like, at some point, I feel like they want to protect the creativity. Yes. and not always have to be on. And can we talk about this really quickly? And I, I cannot not talk about anything with vocal or this comp without talking about mental health. Um, because we see from the pandemic how mental health has become a stigma, not just in people, but in black men. Um, when you talked about Steve Harvey just now and about, you know, turning it on and off, I think about comedians like Robin Williams, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Who you would think he was, but internally there was conflict. Uh, because there was so much more going on. When we think about people like Heath Ledger, mm -hmm. right? That literally took his life from from the character of the of his character taken over, right? Uh, the guy from Harry Potter, who they couldn't tell the difference between, he couldn't tell the difference between Harry Potter and him. After a while, I think it's super, super important that we have to bring in the mental health component here because most of us that are creatives and most of us that are in this space, we deal with two things. We deal with, uh, and that's why I'm a mental health advocate for a reason, because there were times where I had people coming into my office. I couldn't teach them about vocal anything. I had to send, give them a pamphlet to make sure that they were dealing with suicidal ideation, right? I had people come into my office that were dealing, that were on cocaine and sleeping pills, right? That were cutting themselves, drinking pills and drinking a bottle of vodka and sleeping pills. Yeah, because most creatives are melancholic by nature. We have spurts of creativity followed by spurts of depression. A lot of us deal with two things, high functioning anxiety that leads to perfectly hidden depression, perfectly hidden depression. That's why sometimes when a person says something like, oh, they're just antisocial, like they may say, oh, Steve Harvey's antisocial. You don't know if he's dealing with high functioning anxiety and perfectly hidden depression as a grown man, you don't know if he's having internal conflict within him to be like, where's the nearest exit? Because yeah. right now my social anxiety is to the roof and my people monitor is down. And you'll find a lot of people that are in that world and that space deal with well, this. Well, that's another person. Yeah. Charlemagne, he's been very mm, vocal about yeah. that. He's another one where if you see him on The Breakfast Club and yeah. the persona that he's built is very vocal, very out front. Yeah. Very, he's like pretty much the voice of the generation when it comes to radio. He's very, he, he is very um, secluded person mm. he doesn't really like to come out publicly mm. or be around too many people he doesn't he's a very introverted person and that some people might not understand him and yeah. might take it like he's being arrogant yeah. or standoffish but he's actually a, he's a great guy um but yeah it's interesting because it's like people already have a viewpoint of you from how they look at you in a public and if you don't live yeah. up to that then it's disappointment when they actually get to interact with you outside of just yeah. being on television. And I think people need to have grace. You have to have grace with people. It's not easy being personas. I'm pretty sure as you all have gained your notoriety, <laughs> you have to deal with your own. You know, with people wanting to take pictures at you at Invest Fest. They want to come up to you and after a while, it's just like, well, you know, I think people have to understand. You have to have grace with this type of, and some people will never get it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Charlemagne, I know he's very vocal. Um, I've, I've, you know, he, he's very well, he big on mental health. He talks about his anxiety. He wrote a yeah. whole book about, that's why I said his name, because yeah. he talked about having anxiety so bad that you know he couldn't even really function properly wow 
So he had to get therapy and get yeah. help and do all that. And he's been a big um, proponent yeah. Yeah, of right mental there. health. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a real thing, you know, and I, I just want to just make sure for everyone that is so brave um, listening to this or watching this, that's so brave to step out. I applaud you. I applaud you for stepping out and saying, you know what? I have been so fearful to get on to get on stage, but I really believe in InvestFest. I believe in EYL. I believe in what they do. And I just love everything that they do. And the fact that they're giving me an opportunity to be able to change the trajectory of my business. I applaud your bravery. I applaud the fact that you are going to do something out of the norm. I applaud the fact that you are going to step out of your comfort zone because you believe in your brand and you believe that it's the it's time. And so I just wanted to say that to you, have grace with yourself, prepare, of course, um, but just thank you for showing up on that day for all of you that are going to be pitching on that on, on that weekend. No, I'm just thinking this is interesting because a lot of the media guys, they're just like that too. Joe Button, a lot of these people that's in front of the camera are some of the extreme extroverts that you'll ever see in your life. Mm -hmm. like Joe Button is an extreme seclusion, don't want to be around nobody. Wow. It's interesting that you would choose a career where you're literally speaking for a living. That's why I say there's a difference between, there's, there's this thin line and there's a contradiction between being a human doing and a human being. Mm. It's always going to be a conflict. If you don't, there's no one who is called in the space of being a human doing and still have to figure out who you be outside of that. You can't go through life without a therapist. Mm. I'm sorry. Every CEO needs to have a therapist. Okay. You cannot, if you're called to people, no, you're going to have to have therapy. You're going to have to have a good support system. You're going to have to be able to um, have self-care routine. You're going to have to, or else it's going to drive you up the wall. Um, and so for the Joe Buttons and the Steve Harveys and the Charlemans, that's, I'm pretty sure all these guys probably have therapists. You know, they probably have um, a safe space counselor. I don't know if Joe has a therapist. <laughs> I think he does. He does. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm but... sure he does. <laughs> He does? Yeah, they're, they're starlets, I think. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, shout out to Joe. Uh, at, at, oh, at this point of of your your, your journey, yeah, because I feel like it is that you were in the entertainment space, yeah. and now you're working in the entrepreneurial space. Yeah. Talk about the, the contrast and, and which one has been more enjoyable for you to, to, to be part of. The entrepreneurial space. It's interesting because I have two avatars. I have the singers and the speakers that just want to maintain and manage their voice. But then I have this amazing space of creative entrepreneurs who want to level up. They want to get the bag and stuff like that. And I really find a lot of joy in mentoring that side. Not. I've been doing for 20 years, I've been doing the other side mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I will continue to do that, but I'm not in a thing anymore. I have, you know, automated things. I have teams, coaches and stuff like that under me, but I like that space. I do. Well, for you. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Tell people how they can contact any information. That you yeah. Want to so I, I, as I said on the show, I want to give a freebie. I don't like coming somewhere, not bringing a gift. So I offer a gift to you all. So for everyone that wants to at least get some pointers on how to prepare for InvestFest, you've listened to these nuggets. I want you to text the word pitch, P-I-T-C-H to the number 786 Four nine six one seven five eight. All right. Text the word pitch to seven eight six four nine six one seven five eight. You can also find me on all social media at Ashayla Shane, uh, my company Vocal Wall Street. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, all the other ones, and you can go to www.vocalwallstreet.com. Appreciate it. I, I can't let you leave without asking your greatest vocalist, male, female. Oh. Depends on the era. It really do. Best male vocalist of all time. I have two. Okay. Charlie Wilson. Okay. I love Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie. Um, and I really, really like Marvin Winans, but that's a whole nother thing. I don't know if everybody know who he is, but okay. legendary. On the female side, I Whitney Houston all day. I think just every time I see Whitney, think of Whitney, I'm just like, man, she left way before our time. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, I... The, there's so many legends that are out here, so I'm gonna leave it there. I, okay. Notice you, you notice I didn't say new school. Yeah, I said old school for a reason. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm Cause with I you. want them I'm to come you. in the chat for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't say Beyonce, but I, but I will say I'm for the lyricist though. In this, it was for, for the culture for hip hop. <laughs> Woo! 
Ooh, the best era of hip hop right now going on with this whole thing. I'm on the side of the lyricists. Come on, they not like us. Shut up, shut up. Let's go. <laughs> there you have it. We appreciate you. I appreciate you all for having me. It was so much fun. Thank no y'all for problem. having me. Thank, Thank you. you guys for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.